بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم. I wanted to end this course with a soft and tender theme. I've talked to you about muscular women or women that were fighting men and women who made men and women who taught men and women. I don't want you to leave this place with the impression that women was doing this or doing something that was violent and doing something that might have been against her nature, whatever, whatever. So I thought I must end it in a soft note, a more realistic note. Something that every woman should be proud of. A natural sentiment, a natural feeling that every woman should and must and can have, like men. I know that the theme will provoke rejection and will be controversial. And I will be included in the club of the dodgy people. I know that. But I will say it. and let history judge whether I was right in my decision or not. I have called this title love. And I have looked at love from these four paradigms. Love between the two sexes is a natural feeling that some Muslims are embarrassed to talk about because of its abuse and negative connotation particularly in the West. Two, Islam recognized love as a form of an emotional energy that should not be denied or suppressed, but channeled in a halal and in a proper way. Three, the Prophet Wasallam recognized the occurrence of love as a feeling, even if not yet consummated with marriage. provided it was not translated into an unlawful practice. For when woman loves, she is faithful to the one whom she is in love with and protects this love with means that to men may seem unusual. And this fourth point, I will justify it with my last story in this theme. I have a few stories and... Some of them might be a little bit strange to you, but I will have to tell you these stories. You remember that I began the course with listing the rights of women that Islam recognized, and that one of the daughters of Ja'far ibn Abi Talib went to consult two elderly men from an Ansar. Do you remember? She went to consult them because her father enforced this particular person by way of a husband on her. Do you remember what the two elderly Ansaris said to her? They said to her, no, this marriage will not happen because Khansa bint Khaddam, her father, married her against her will and the marriage was cancelled. I didn't want to tell you then one small piece of information. Khansa bint Khaddam now has actually a story to tell about why she did not like this person that was imposed on her by her father. When that person was imposed on her, she actually went to a Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this is a little girl speaking to the holiest of holy, to the purest Of the pure, she is speaking to a Rasul Sallallahu She's not speaking to a Sheikh, to a Mawlana, to a Hafiz. No, she is speaking to the Sheikhs of all these Sheikhs. To a Rasul Sallallahu Yet, yet, and this is the point. She was not embarrassed to articulate and express her feelings to him. She said, Ya Rasul Allah, I don't want to marry this man. And that's literally what she said. إن عما ولدي أحب إلي My cousin is more beloved to me. Meaning what? I love my cousin. He cancelled the marriage. She could have said to him, I don't like him. That's not the one. That's not the one that I'm dreaming about. 
Are you in love with someone? No, no, it's just that I don't want him. She is making a positive statement now. No, I don't want him and I am in love with someone else. Did Rasulullah say, behave yourself, you rude person? Did he slap her? Did he say, how dare you? We are in Medina and I'm the ruler, the Nabi of this ummah. Come on. If someone said to Rasulullah I want to commit adultery, he did not slap him. Why did this poor girl with legitimate feelings should be slapped? I'm trying slowly but surely to introduce love to you now. You might, the moment I mentioned it, what the hell are you going to speak about? Well, that's exactly some of it. Let me give you another story. There was a husband and a wife at the time of Ar Rasul. They might not be famous, or they are not famous to a lot of you, if not all, except because of their love story. What was their story? The man was called Mughith. The woman was called Burayra. Now, Mughith was in deep love with Burayra. But Burayra did not love Mughith. So she asked for a divorce. And the problem did not end for Mughith. Literally, sisters and sisters and sisters and brothers, literally, Mughith more or less lost his mind. Read in the books of history, in fact, it's in Bukhari. Mughith, whenever Burayra is walking, he is walking after her, following her and crying and begging her, begging her to return to him. And Burayra just ignores him. And he goes in the city. And I always say this, imagine I took you now, 2006, and I've placed you in Medina. What would you expect to see? You would expect to see someone fasting there, someone praying there. So this is the idealist, isn't it? And you might see someone who is crying and you say, surely now I'm in Medina. This is the prophetic society. He's crying out of the fear of Allah. And he will look at you and say, no, I'm crying because I'm in love. What would you say? In love with who? With Allah? No, in love with a woman. What would you say? Am I in Medina or where am I? You know, I'm in the wrong city or what? This is exactly what was happening. So much so that Ar Rasulullah looked to Ibn Abbas and literally said to him, Ya Ibn Abbas, Ala ta'jabu min hubbi mughitha burira wa min bughdi burira mughithan? And the tears is coming on the beard of mughith. You know what Rasulullah said to Ibn Abbas? He said to him, Ibn Abbas, aren't you surprised? Isn't it strange to you to see this emotion, to see this love from Mughith to Burayra? And on the other hand, he says, and isn't it strange to see this hate from Burayra to Mughith? He's talking, Rasulullah is, is so sensitive that he wants Ibn Abbas to share with him this amazement of two extreme emotions. Neither were rejected. He wasn't making a critical statement about either. He was just saying, isn't it strange? Isn't it strange that when someone is in this deep love, this is what he does? And isn't it strange when someone was, is in deep hate, this is what he does? And then ar Sallam respects the feeling of Mughith. He respects his feelings. He's a human being. He's in love. He goes to Burayra and says, Burayra, why don't you return to Mughith? He's crying day and night for you. Can't you see what you are doing to him? He's going after you in the streets of Medina. Isn't there a possibility that you might consider? And Burayra sits, and this is the, I'm not talking about a rude feminist girl. No, decent, but just doesn't love him. He says, Ya Rasulullah, is this an order? He says, no, it's just a shafa'a. I'm just trying to mediate. She said, then no, Ya Rasulullah. Then no, Ya Rasulullah. And Rasulullah stops there. End of story. I have thought about this story and came up with, 
five comments. One comment was, Mughith is walking publicly in the streets crying, not feeling ashamed, not feeling embarrassed. And I don't recall in the hadith that there were people clapping and saying, look at Mughith, he's in love. What a loser, what a sad man. I cannot recall in the hadith someone coming and giving khutbah for half an hour. Ittaqillah, ya Mughith, what are you talking about? Go and pray. In fact, it's the opposite. I am in front of two people. One is the greatest of the great. The second is Habrul Ummah, Ibn Abbas, watching this image and sympathizing with it. Number one. This is one comment. Second comment. It is this genuine feeling that Mughith articulated. It is this genuine action of him is what made Mughith famous. I don't recall that Mughith have narrated a hadith or is famous for being knowledgeable. or fa- He's a companion, yes. But whenever you mention to a scholar Mughith, straight away the Mughith, the lover of Burayra. He have registered himself in history because of this genuine articulation and expression of the feeling so much so that a hadith, an entire hadith was built and based upon this action and Bukhari comes and registers this hadith in the book of Bukhari. The hadith says, قال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم لعباس يا ابن عباس ألا تعجب من حب مغيث بريرة ومن بغض بريرة مغيث This is a hadith because you know that whatever Rasul Sallam Mentions is a hadith. Even if it was a comment on something that you might think is trivial. It's a hadith. And scholars sit on that hadith to try to extract fiqhi and hadith and, and, and from this story. I don't want to be extreme. But if I wanted, I could. By saying, I'm grateful to Mughith. Because it's because of Mughith that Rasulullah uttered this hadith. And that we learned from Mughith's action. This hadith that we now worship Allah through memorizing. If I wanted to be extreme, or maybe it's because we are living in an extreme age that a statement that is otherwise normal is considered extreme. Number three, the fact that this person is crying in public, the fact that he is gaining sympathy from someone who, of course, when the Sahaba sees that he is gaining sympathy, of course the Sahaba will be also sympathizing. No one will say to Rasulullah, Ya Rasulullah, what are you talking about? How can you sympathize with a lover? No, he is the master and whatever he does, you should do. That means that the entire of society accepted this phenomenon. This is number three. Number four, Rasulullah did not just sympathize, recognize, I understand, I know exactly how you feel. No, he actually interceded and interfered and left his battles and left his problems in administering the political affairs of the ummah to solve a love problem. An emotional relationship between a man and a woman and went and actually spoke to Burayra and said, Burayra, is there a chance in which you can consider? She said, no. So it's more than just recognition and understanding. The fifth and final point is that the word no, no, no shows that women has feelings and strong feelings and that Islam and Rasulullah respects these feelings even if these feelings are considered by the man who is expected to be loved but in real terms is not even if that is painful to him but this is life but this is life we should respect I mean Rasulullah did not go and say look I order you and I would expect that if Mughith came and said to Ya Rasulullah what did she say Rasulullah would say she said no Ya Rasulullah, can you force her? Rasulullah, of course, would say no. So, all in all, respect for this concept of love. I know that L-O-V-E and this red heart, uh, love heart, and Valentine Day, I know that in the West, the word love now is being abused and has negative connotation. But I'm not going to allow that this abuse of the word to make me refrain from using it because it was there. It's a human phenomena. It's a natural phenomena. The, the way that you express it, yes, we can discuss that. But as a feeling, it's legitimate. And it shows that we are humans. We are not machines or animals. It shows that. It shows that to parents who want to marry their daughters by force to X and Y. It shows that I am a human being, even if I was 16. Let me tell you another radical story. 
This time, it's Zainab, the daughter of Ar Rasul, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Zainab is the first baby that was born from this marriage between Ar Rasul Sallam and Khadija. So she is the eldest daughter. You are aware that all the daughters, all the sons died during the lifetime of Ar Rasul Sallam, except Fatima, that died six months after the death of Ar Rasul Sallam. So Zainab actually died during the lifetime of Ar Rasul Sallam. And Rasulullah loved Zainab a lot, a lot, a lot. Of course, he loved Ruqayya and Umm Kalthum, but he loved his first baby. She was born when Rasulullah was 30, and 10 years before he became a prophet. Now, Zainab got married based on her consent to her cousin, Abu al-As ibn al-Rabi'ah. That was his name. A lot of you might not know him. She actually had two children from him. One was called Ali, and the other was called Umama. Umama is the girl, Ali is the boy. Ali passed away. Umama grew up and got married to Ali ibn Abi Talib. This is not important. I'm focusing on Zainab now, but I just thought that I might introduce Zainab to you. Abu al-As loved Zainab so much, but he was not willing to embrace Islam. During the battle of Badr, Abu al-As fought with the mushriks. Incidentally, before I tell you this, during the migration of Rasulullah and everyone migrated, but there were a minority that were left behind, Zainab was one of them. So Zainab did not, she remained with her husband. That is before the verse that a woman should not be associated with a non-Muslim. Then she departed. But during that time, she was living with her husband, Mushrik, Kafir. So during the Battle of Badr, he traveled with the Mushrikeen to Badr to fight al Rasul and he was taking a hostage. So Zainab, the daughter of al Rasul got the news, received the news. But what can she do? She's a Muslim, he's a Mushrik, this is Rasulullah, her father. Legally speaking, she can't do anything. But life is more complicated than legalities and fiqh. Life is about emotions as well. Even if you cannot confess it. What are you talking about? What I'm saying is that she loved him. And she was in love with him. This is her husband for the last 20 years. She loves him. So what did she do? When Ar Rasul pronounced that we can release cap hostages, provided that you can pay for their ransom, you know what Zainab did? She took her Nicholas and said to the Mushrik, one, one Kafir person, said to him, go to Medina and give this to my father. This is my ransom to release my husband. When Ar Rasul saw the Nicholas, he immediately realized where it's coming from. Do you know where it's coming from? This Nicholas has been given as a gift from Khadija. Now, this is my beloved woman, Ar Rasul Ar Rasul by the way, I heard one psychologist, Muslim psychologist in Saudi Arabia, Dr. Tariq Al Habib. He said, Ar Rasul loved Aisha with his heart, but loved Khadija with his heart and mind. This is a, I'm not going now to talk about Khadija and Rasul, but this is a, you know, to love someone with your heart and mind, I think this is the highest level of love. Sometimes you love a woman in your mind, sometimes you love a woman in your heart, but to be able to love with the heart and the mind, it means a lot. It means a lot. Ar Rasul Khadija was different, something else. Khadija was different, full stop. I won't say more than this. You have to appreciate. Anyway, actually, if you know why, you would then appreciate why Aisha was jealous from Khadija, even when Khadija is dead. Can you be jealous from a dead person? Yes, if she is so special.
So a Rasul when he saw the Nicholas, he shivered. This is the Nicholas that Khadija gave to my daughter on her wedding day. Now, taking this Nicholas as a ransom means what? Means that you will take the Nicholas, you will give it to the Muslim army, they will sell it, I don't know what they will do with it, and build something with the money. That means the Nicholas is gone. So a Rasul wants to do two things. He wants to release Abu al-As so as not to break the heart of his daughter, but at the same time doesn't want to lose the Nicholas. So he said to the Muslims, he said, would you agree to release Abu al-As and he can take the Nicholas with him home? Of course, Sahaba know. Know the Nicholas. Know, Abu know, know who is Abu al-As. Know about Rasulullah and Khadija. Know about Rasulullah and Zainab. Know about, I mean, come on, this is his father in law. They said, Of course, Ya Rasulullah. So Abu al As took the Qilada and went to Mecca. And his, of course, Zainab was happy. And he said, Look, he gave me the Qilada, Muhammad, your father. Of course, he did not yet become a Muslim. Then, Rasulullah ordered Zainab that now the verses are revealed, you should leave your husband. You should divorce him. So Zainab told Abu al-As, told him, and this is where now emotions must stop because of halal and haram and because of legal and because pleasing Allah. You see, I'm not as dodgy as you think. I am aware of what I'm talking about. I am saying that in a context of halal, emotionality is not a source of embarrassment. But when something is being committed haram, I'm not going to recognize this dodgy word called love. Now I will agree with you. And that is exactly what Zainab understood. So she said to Abu al-As, I will have to leave. And Abu al-As was a real gentleman. He said to her, I will secure your travel from Mecca to Medina. I will make you know, a group of men and women escort you to Medina. Take care of yourself. I don't know if he said to her, I'll see you soon or maybe one day we'll meet. But that was the last time they saw each other in that context. So she left. Years passed and years passed. One day, Abu al-As was traveling on a trade business trip he came from Damascus, moving into Mecca. And he was captured again by a group of Muslims. Because Muslims, you know, caravans, you are aware, the caravans, any caravan, they would attack and take the booties, etc. So they captured him again. They captured him, took him where? Took him to Medina. Who is in Medina? Zainab. Zainab now is in Medina. Believe me or don't believe me. You go and check it out. Our Rasul Sallallahu respects those who make ijara for prisoners. What does ijara mean? Means that if you are someone who is respectable, if you are someone who is uh, trustworthy, you can go to our Rasul Sallallahu and say, Ya Rasul Allah, I will give ijara to this person. I will protect this person. This person should be treated decently. No one should harm. No one should attack this person. And Rasulullah would respect that. Zainab went and made ijara to Abu al-As. And Rasulullah knew that. He spoke to the society and said, we have to give ijara to whoever. Do you accept the ijara of Zainab? I have the quotes here. Yes, دخلت زينب إلى أبيها تطلب منه أن تجير أبا العاص فخرج النبي على المسلمين قائلا أيها الناس هل سمعتم ما سمعت قالوا نعم فوالذي نفسي بيدي ما علمت بشيء مما كان حتى سمعت الذي سمعت it's, it's a long She says to him Zainab says to Rasulullah Sallam Ya oh my father I have protected Abu al-As, and he is in my house. And Rasulullah said to the companions in the mosque, have you heard what I have heard? They said, yes, Ya Rasulullah. He said, Wallahi, I have not heard this before. Don't think that this is a setup. 
Don't think that I've done it with my daughter just to, you know, we are be pretending. This is the first time I hear it. Nonetheless, do you agree? Nonetheless, do you accept her ijara? They said, we accept Ya Rasulullah. Okay, fine. Then he goes into the house of Zainab. He says, Zainab, la yaqrabannaki. Zainab, don't go closer to him. Don't take him to your bedroom, basically. فَإِنَّهُ لَا يَحِلْ for, for, for he is not permissible. وَأَمَرَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ زَيْنَبْ أَلَّا يَقْرَبَهَا لِأَنَّهَا لَا تَحِلُّ لَهُ مَا دَامَ مُشْرِكًا He stayed for a while and then lived for a while in Medina, saw this amazing woman, saw this amazing father-in-law, saw this amazing society, saw this amazing people that offering him protection. He said, Zainab, I must go. I have business to do in Mecca. He went to Mecca, sold everything, and came back knocking the door on Zainab, saying, Zainab, will you marry me? I became a Muslim. And she remarried him again. Did they live happily ever after? Unfortunately, no, because a couple of months and years, Zainab passed away. This is a story of love or not? What is it? Some of these stories have been for years narrated to you, but from a fiqhi point of view, from a sharia point of view, from a hadith point of view. Today, I chose to do something different. I have a final story. I have a story of a very powerful woman, very jealous woman, who was called Um Salama. Um Salama was married to one important ruler in the Umayyad Caliphate. Her mother-in-law is Umm al-Banin. But her husband died, and she fell in love with Abu al-Abbas al-Saffah. Abu al-Abbas al-Saffah is the founder of the Abbasid Caliphate. He was extremely handsome, good-looking, so she loved him. And she wanted to marry him. And she sent a girl to propose to him. And he said, at that time, he was not a caliph yet. He was not a founder of anything. He was a poor man. So she proposed, and he said to the girl, well, I'm extremely poor, I cannot pay her any dowry. So she went and said to him, look, I want to marry you now. You take these 700 dinars and give me 500 dinar by way of a dowry and keep the rest. So she actually paid for her dowry and she gave him an extra pocket money. What a fascinating wife. I don't think she exists today. So she loved her, Abu al-Abbas al-Saffah, and she loved him a lot, a lot, a lot. And she was a very romantic woman. One day, of course, he became rich. He became the caliph, Abu al-Abbas al-Saffah. One day they were on the top of their palace, and he was playing with his wedding ring. And his wedding ring dropped. Let me wear it before my wife. <laughs> so it dropped from the top of the palace. And... Um Salama took her wedding ring and dropped it so that it touches on the ground his wedding ring. He said to her, why did you do that? What a romantic statement. She said, I don't want your wedding ring to stay there alone for a, a long period of time. It will feel lonely. So I had to keep this in touch with it. You know what is amazing is that these words have been registered by historians. They were not rosy, pinky words said in the middle of the night in a bedroom. No, they were words that maybe a servant heard them and wrote them, and now I am telling these words to you. So they were in great love. But that's not my story. My story is that one day, she heard a well-known speaker, eloquent speaker, he can really manipulate you and play with you like a Scientologist. Any Scientologist here? Okay. So he can play and manipulate you. His name is Khalid ibn Safwan, a very well-known speaker, well-known eloquent speaker. So Khalid ibn Safwan one day was sitting with Abi Abbas al-Saffah. He said, Ya Amir al muminin to how many women are you married? He said, I am married only to one. He said, Ya Amir al muminin someone who is rich like you, someone who is handsome like you, you know, you should get married. Anyone will marry you. I can bring you 
the beautiful black women. I can bring you the beautiful red women. I can bring you the blondest of blonde. So I can bring you all colors. I can bring you the tall. I can bring you the short. I can bring you the thin. I can bring you the fat. I can bring you all the attractive women in the age, in the time, in the culture. And he began, and I've got what he said to him. And subhanAllah, when I read it, sometimes I say, you know, where is Khalid ibn Safwan? I would like to get to know him. He's describing women to him. He says, I will bring you this with this nose. I'll bring you this with... So Abu al-Abbas, at the beginning, at the beginning, said, no, 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 no. But then he said to him at the end, he said, Wallahi, you've changed my mind totally. Do such women exist? He said, yes, you just say. You just make the niya and I will do it. And then he said, okay, let me think about it. He did a mistake, Abu al-Abbas. He did a mistake like Yazid when he went and said to Umm al-Banin about Hajjaj. Abu al-Abbas, in the middle of the night, cannot go to sleep. So Umm Salama says to him, what's wrong? What's, what's in your mind? Why can't you go to bed? He said, no, nothing. She said, no, no. Tell me, why? And, you know, when a woman insists and you cannot escape, so he had to tell her at the end. He said, today I was actually with Khalid ibn Safwan, and he began to tell me about getting married. And you know what? He began to tell me about this woman and this woman, and and she began to insult Khalid. And what else did this person, this, I don't know what word she used, what else did he say to you? What else did he say to you? He said, look, why, why are you insulting him? He wants the best for me. Why are you are attacking him? Why are you, what did he do to you? Come on, don't you know? Anyway, so why are you insulting him? She said, okay, I will deal with Khalid. The following day, the, she was not like Umm al-Banin, bring uh, Hajjaj to me, no, no. Khalid ibn Safwan, now we zoom the camera into Khalid's house. Khalid ibn Safwan. He says, one day I was in the front of my house. The following day, after having this conversation with the Khalifa, said, I was standing in front of my house chatting to some friends. And suddenly I saw a group of huge, muscular people wearing the clothes of the palace. And I said to myself, I know why they are coming. They are coming to give me this great gift of money as a result of what I said to the Khalifa yesterday. They came to him. They said, you are Khalid? He said, yes. And they began beating him and beating him and beating him. He said, I was about to die. I ran into the house and shut the door. And he said, I stayed there for a while. And not for a while. He was actually put under house arrest. He said, I feared opening the door, these, you know, I don't know who will attack again. So I remained in the house until one day, after a week or two, someone knocked on my door and said, I am from the palace. The Khalifa wants to speak to you. I opened the door. Are you sure the Khalifa? Yes. And then he said, okay, I will go with you. And then he went to the palace and met Al-Abbas again. Al-Abbas said to him, I missed you. Where have you been? He said, uh, Incidentally, you have to be aware that there are bugs, you know, in palaces. And usually there are not electronic bugs, but women are sitting with the, so listening. So now he's aware because he learned now. Whatever I'm going to say now, I'm going to pay up a, a high price for it. So he said, no, nothing. I was ill, ya Amir al-Mu'mineen. <laughs> sure you were. So he said, I was ill, ya Amir al-Mu'mineen. He said, you know why I called you today? He said, yes, Why? He said, I want you to resume your beautiful talk. Since a couple of weeks, I've been thinking about nothing other than the very beautiful words that you were saying. He said, what? What beautiful words? What? What, what, you know, what did I say? He said to him, you talk to me about women, beautiful women. He said, look, Amir al muminin I must tell you something. The worst thing to do in this life is to marry a second wife. And wallahi, those who are having more than one wife, wallahi, they live in hell. I tell you this. That's literally what he says. Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, ad-durrataini min ad-durr, wa man kana indahu akthar min wahida, kana fi durr, wa juhd. 
בגיט, what am ריס? what what הדג? to get married to why are you laughing? to get married to another woman. he said this is not what you told me. he said no that's what I told you Amir al Mu'mini maybe you forgot. and if you forgot I'm going to remind you. I told you that three women are like three crusades coming to you in the middle of the night. Ibn Abbas, Ibn Abbas is related to Rasulullah He's from the Abbas side. He says, Wallahi, I am not related to Rasulullah By Allah, I have no relation to Rasulullah if this is what you told me. It's an Arabic way of saying, this is far away from what you told me. Wallahi, I have never heard these words before. No, he said to him, Wallahi, this is what I told you. I even told you that four women is like illness and diseases coming all on the top of you all together. He said, Wallahi, I never heard this from you. And then he said, Wallahi, I said this to you. He said, do you mean that I'm a liar or crazy? He said, no, ya amir al muminin But I told you that those virgin women are rubbish. Actually, they are not virgin. And actually, they are, in reality, they are men in disguise. That's what he says. That's what he says. Actually, he says, you know, a very bad word, but I'm not going to say it. He wants to rescue himself from another kick in the face so he can say anything. And when he said this, like all virgin women are like men, he could see someone giggling from behind a curtain. He said, and I told you, Ya Amir al muminin that the best women on this earth are those from Bani Makhzum. <laughs> this, is the, this is our tribe. And she was sitting at the back saying, Oh, Allah, yes, yes, Allah, yes, Allah, you are right. <laughs> Allah, you are right, ya amma, oh, my cousin, Allah, you are right. And then he said, I left. And a couple of days, I saw the same muscular men with, oh, oh no, what, you know, what wrong did I do? They came, they gave me a donkey, they gave me a horse, They gave me 10,000 dinar and they gave me lots of gold. So I was happy. Sisters and brothers, I am done with this course. I hope you enjoyed it, but not just enjoyed it. I hope you learned from this course. I know that there were a lot of problems in this course. I know that there were politically incorrect statements that I did articulated. Please accept my apology. And I am sorry if I have offended anyone. This is number one. Number two, I was not here coming all the way to narrate stories. These stories, I could have written them in a book, emailed them to you, or uh, just uh, written them and came here and read them to you. I want us to get from this course with practical lessons. I first of all want to entertain. This is the slogan of the BBC. I want to inform, educate, and to entertain. I'm not here to entertain, entertain, and entertain. Although I feel that we need to be entertained in this hot weather, and you have been very patient, audience with me sitting here, you know, with all these bottles of water, people are doing like this, and I'm sure that some people had headaches with my crazy stories. We all suffered. So are we going to waste all that? Are we going to take the tube now home and open friends and, uh, you know, watch this movie or this film? Or are we going to say, how can I benefit from this course? How can I be a different person after this course? So this is, I leave it to you. Number three, I would like you to establish a friendship with one woman only in that entire course. Which woman is it? Which one will you choose? Was it the women that had a U-turn? Was it the women with success? Was it Um Salama that will beat everyone up who wants to get married to her husband? All what you need to do is to identify your potentials and capacities and capabilities. And identify then the women that her story has some relevance and compatibility to your story. And try then to be inspired by this woman. Don't think about all the women. Not all the women are suitable for all of you. But certainly, I hope I have succeeded in introducing even if one woman that you found attractive, that you found appealing. Oh, brothers, you can be attracted to one woman that I have mentioned here. Maybe there is one woman that was compatible 
to your own aspirations, to your own U-turn, to your own success. Don't let the fact that she was a woman makes you feel that she is not relevant. She was a human being, a decent human being, and I think that we all have to learn lessons from the women that I have introduced. I am happy now with what I did. I always wanted to do great men, so four great imams. I always wanted to do children because I am a father. But I always felt doing injustice to a lot of sisters who come and attend. And I say to myself, if I was a sister listening to Bukhari, Shafi'i, etc., I want to know about women. So I said, this is my thanking statement to you. And I am happy with these three series of courses. And maybe I need a couple of years to think about something new. But maybe if I thought about something, it would be an overview on Islamic history. But that would not be in the summer because you will have a terrible headache from lecture number one or seerah. The seerah of our Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But I thank you all for being with me today and Jazakumullah khair.